Yeah, she can wait there. So 10 minutes we have, so we'll do it collaboratively. So I'll tell uh, my background, and I'll let Carol mention hers. Uh, so I'm a human doc, and I'm probably on the exact opposite spectrum of many of you when we talked last time, so I'm not technologically inclined in any way, shape, or form. I probably would harm any of the technology you guys have worked on if you gave it to me. So, but I can tell you where we need help, and that's kind of uh, the big side of collaboration. And uh, Carol is a poultry veterinarian, so as I'm a human doc, she's an uh, animal specialist. And we work often together. Sorry. I'm a human doc too, but my patients are Yeah, animals. sorry. She's a human doc too, but her patients are animals. <laughs> so I've been very appropriately corrected. So, but I would defer that she's also an animal doc, as we all are. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, with that, um, we often work in tandem to look at risk, risk, risk assessment, and um, really reducing uh, the transmission between humans and animals. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, just the side where we function, why it's bad, show you a couple pictures of where we kind of run into issues, and then um, if you guys have questions about the technology side of that um, and so forth. So um, obviously there's lots of bad things with zoonoses, um, and you know they can impact our food, to, food supply. So when we look at that, um, avian influenza, we're all familiar with it. You know, if you have to cull a few billion birds, that becomes a problem with food supply. Not so much in our country, but in other countries. Uh, exotic Newcastle disease, which is ultra, also a poultry disease, other livestock diseases. It can certainly impact other animal populations, so it does impact wild, wild animals, wild birds, and other populations as well. Certainly, we can see uh, increased disease in humans, and this is uh, my side of thing, things where I get interested, either just smaller sporadic diseases, so things like Q fever, brucellosis, stuff we see in farmers and farmhands on a regular basis, but also the emergence of new infections. So SARS being a classic example of something that really had to do a lot with food supply and zoonoses pretty classically. So where do we need help uh, when we do a lot of this work? Well, one of the big things, and I'll also let Carol mention it because she may have some ideas, is determining risk. So as a, a doctor and as a public health person, it's very hard for me to often assess risk and what do things mean. So if I get a call and that someone has handled or has consumed a dead bird, what does that mean? And how do we look at that risk? And what impact does that have for us? And you know, we certainly look at things like hand washing that we talked about and whether someone you know, touched a bird, came close to a bird, handled a bird, for example. But you know, what about other new technologies or diagnoses? So can we rapidly sequence maybe a virus and look for changes or look for particular genes that might actually impact the risk? So does it carry a gene that increases virulence and then we can make some assessment you know, that this person is actually at higher risk than another person who ran into a flu virus, but this is not so bad. And that's one of the things that's very hard for us to do and to be able to do that quickly. Because we can kind of do you know, sequencing of this virus, but it might happen six months, a year later, and that really helps us for future events, but it doesn't help us in the now and doesn't really help us immediately. And really it's you know, obviously then taking some of those risks and linking it to actions in humans in real time. So if we can isolate a virus or isolate a bug and also link it to their actions and what they're doing and be able to do that in some form of real time, that really allows us to intervene up front and not intervene you know, months down the road when you know, this virus or this emerging disease is out of the barn, so to speak, and is spread among wildlife, um, you know, domesticated animals and, and humans. So, and the second thing is improved uh, rapid detection. So really this is this idea of point of care testing. So for us and the way most diseases are reported to us now, and I can think of the last example of avian influenza that we potentially thought we had here. You know, this was someone that came in, had a severe respiratory illness, was sent to us here at UC Davis, had been on a farm where a lot of poultry died overseas. And you know, for us, it's very hard to get that test right away. We have to order it. We have to properly mail it down to, uh, to actually now it used to be in Berkeley, in Richmond, to the state lab. They do their tests. These are things that often would help us much more dramatically in the field. So if you had an outbreak in a poultry farm or on another farm, with the livestock and you had symptomatic workers who you know, were uh, you know, minimally skilled and less educated, we can do that testing there, find out during, you know, immediately after exposure or in the early onset of symptoms that this was something we need to worry about or not at all worry about would certainly rapidly help us as well. And um, you know, certainly, and I can have Carol mention that, the veterinary world lags behind the human world in rapid testing. So you know, when a bird costs not that much money and you're not sure whether it's infected or not, it's certainly a lot easier to euthanize and kill the bird in human medicine, we don't have that option. So for us, we certainly have more rapid points of care and testing that we can look at. And, and also, we have more resources. Let me give you a microphone. Yeah, OK, sorry. So, OK. Um, I, I think the other issue we have um, is that uh, sample cleanup is more of an issue for, for animals than for humans, mostly. 
So, which we'll show you in some pictures in a second. So, um, obviously, improve protection. So, anything you can do um, to help in, you know improve us in protection would be great. So, I'll show you some pictures uh, in a second. But you know, we have people gown up and wear gloves, and they might wear these fancy suits. And once you put them on, you know, try and draw blood from somebody. Try and deliver health care. You know, if you want to actually take a set of vital signs, which we saw earlier in some of this newer technology, if you're actually in some of these gowns, it's extremely difficult to deliver health care or animal care in any way, shape, or form. Um, you, know, what, de, you know, design what we would call idiot-proof biosecurity. So um, this might be sort of newer cleaning and cutting-edge viral and bactericidal methods. And, um, you know, when I show you some pictures, I'm sure Carol will mention this. You know, taking a pressure hose to an infected cage is, may not be the best option as, you know, that virus now splashes up in your face and is aerosolized, but this is often what occurs. Or if a truck is leaving, you know, hosing it down before it leaves the farm or enters the farm, you know, is that a rapid and appropriate way to reduce the spread of disease? Probably not. So any quick and effective way to do that, and we'll show you some pictures. And then lastly, which is more up Carol's alley, is, is this idea of mass carcass disposal. So if you do have a billion birds, you know, it, I don't think there's incinerators that can burn quite, quite that quickly. So any newer technology to remove, you know, large amounts of these infected carcasses or specimens um, that Carol was mentioning certainly would help. And this is, uh, you know, a big issue. You guys probably saw, you know, with the hoof and uh, mouth disease in England where they were burning a lot of the um, carcasses. I mean, very difficult to handle a lot of these. So, and I'll show you some pictures which we can have Carol chime in. So this is uh, all familiar from her, but. You know, this is the type of sign we'd have for biosecurity saying keep out. You know, if there was technology that can certainly be a little bit different than this and maybe more alarming than a sign which someone may or may not pay attention to, you know, say they don't really read English and, or pay attention to the English, and um, that can become an issue as well. Um, so here's some biosecurity from Carol's as well, you know, hosing down the sides of the truck. That's kind of, what do you say, Carol, that's pretty standard biosecurity in most places. Oh, sorry, this is better biosecurity, according to her, in many places. So, you know, you can imagine, you know, how good is this going to be if they've, say, run over a few chicken carcasses on the way in, and this virus is now with some feathers ingrained on the underside or in here or in places that are difficult uh, to eradicate. And I'll show you some more PP, but here's a standard, uh, you know, sort of PP outfit. Pretty simple. You know, he doesn't have gowns, glove, and a mask. But now wear this on a day like today outside when you're working in a poultry farm that's closed in and doing your administration, or there's an outbreak among people and you have to wear this when you then intervene, you're going to last about a half hour in this equipment and then you're about finished. And you'll feel pretty miserable. So you can't really deliver your health care or do adequate risk assessment um, in this sort of uh, environment. And then this was from Egypt or I'm taking this away, Pakistan, excuse me. So um, you can certainly see once you start leaving um, a country like the United States or continental Europe where you may have more resources, um, you know, I don't need to speak to the biosecurity here, but if you have a, all the dead chickens in the background kind of speak to their cells, you know, this is a guy who just has a simple mask, you know, minimal gloves, actually not even gloves, excuse me, they're plastic bags. You know, this is the type of risk for us as healthcare professionals that scare the heck out of us. So, you know, doing risk assessment and intervention before this guy even gets into the chicken house to touch these is re be really appropriate for our end. So it would certainly reduce the risk dramatically. Or, you know, other ways besides these guys just catching some chickens, you know, that they now need to, call, that they now need to you know, catch and, and kill, essentially. So certainly, again, any technology that can either eradicate this disease on the farm or take care of that for us in a more rapid way. That, what about the guy? Exactly. What about the guy not in a biohazard suit? It sucks to be him. <laughs> so to speak, but, you know, not that the other ones are much better, but this is exactly the problem. You know, you have a lack of resources, you know, or even if you could have testing and know that this farm is at risk or not before even undergoing an endeavor like this would be even much better. So it would certainly be helpful. Now, what about this mass carcass disposal? So it looks like it's kind of outside Secaucus in New Jersey, if you've ever been there. This is pretty much where much of the trash is dumped illegally. So, you know, again, more rapid disposal of, of this equipment would certainly help uh, or these carcasses would help uh, dramatically. And I'll have Carol tell the story of these, but these birds were smuggled, is that right? So, you know, this would be another way of detection in, detecting this. Um, this very much alive uh, Thai hawk eagle is the first case of uh, high path AI in Belgium. It was smuggled into the country. It was purchased in a, a flea market in, um, actually there were three birds. Uh, they were purchased in a flea market in Thailand and placed into these uh, wicker tubes in which they lie very quietly and uh, they were caught in customs and so uh, they're very much alive 
very, you know, healthy looking to the normal person. They had pneumonia. Uh, but they uh, exposed a lot of customs officials and a lot of individuals. So detection here is an issue. So all of our ports are, you know, importing huge numbers of, of birds illegally. Um, I, you know, lots of avian influenza, highly pathogenic avian influenza from the bad bird flu, as I call it, from Asia. So again, a lovely uh, thing to see, which also helps. Uh, dramatically. And then, uh, so you can see here, same sort of thing, you know, you're working in this environment, many guys suited up, walking extensively, you know, spreading disease around, again, would be much easier for detection and containment uh, and control. Um, you know, we talked about, we just heard about uh, role of telemedicine with ophthalmology. Carol and I have looked a lot about telemedicine in a role like this, where you could have a hot zone, so to speak, which might be inside. All these guys could wait outside and communicate very rapidly and easily with the inside group not allowing the spread of workers back and forth like they would in this state. So again, another role of technology. Um, again, the idea of carcass removal here. Um, this is actually from China, is that right? So, um, you know, if you don't have the right PP and the right people, you bring in the army. So, which is uh, also very limited. So, I, as last time I looked, I don't think camouflage stops disease <laughs> any better than anything else that I know. So, it certainly makes it extremely uh, difficult. And then, um, looking at the practical stuff, um, this is one of our avian flu schools in, in uh, Africa that we did some training where it's actually, you know, very skilled where they can do sample, sample testing, uh, wearing the appropriate PPE, donning and doffing it, so taking it on and off. So all great stuff, but again, wearing this in sub-Saharan Africa for any extended period of time is extremely uncomfortable. So not only is there detection, it's having adequate protection that can be functional and useful, which really plays an important role. So these are nice Tyvek suits. They're very good, just very difficult to wear for any extended period. So, I mean, I did one procedure once for 25 minutes in one of these and nearly passed out, so um, extremely difficult. So, and these are the types of things that they'll often do um, uh, with these. So, you know, you think it's not a lot, but once you put the suit on, you know, obviously shipping stuff, vaccinating a chicken, bleeding a chicken, doing basic, a basic rapid flu test, which many of you guys have seen. This is in a it's basic ELISA or EIA. This is putting the sample, a little bit of a reagent, like a pregnancy test, waiting for the little you know, color to change. Not very hard, but in these suits, this becomes very difficult with the gloves and to be able to handle those reagents like that. And ah, I had one last picture, but I think that's it. So anyway, with that, I'll see if Carol has anything and if you guys have questions for us for ideas or collaborations. So, um, so that's